The History of the Harry Attenberg and Its Environs Part 2 The Cedar Squirrel War The Empress Eloise marched her infantry and what tattered remnants of her cavalry she could find back to Greenmead, where Jack the Hat presented her with a very imperial bonnet and, in an elaborate ceremony, Mary Green was installed as the Honourable Mary Green, Lady of Greenmead. Afterwards, the Empress Eloise spoke to her niece. Mary, she said, you are a ruler now, and that is a significant responsibility. I must return to Schnifflstadt, but I will leave the fancy boys here in case of any trouble, and Colonel Larderstock will give you good advice. But if I can give you some advice now, the Harrietans are likely to try again to replace you with your uncle, and I suggest you give some thought to building up your armed forces. The Honourable Mary Green was pretty wise for a girl of eight. She tipped her head to one side and looked at her aunt. Thank you, she said. I recall that the treaty I signed requires in the first place that Greenmead makes an annual payment to Schnifflstadt so I will first review the finances of Greenmead to ensure that we are in a position to make that payment. Her aunt nodded, approvingly. The other clause of that treaty, Lady Green continued, requires that the armed forces of Greenmead are placed at your disposal whenever you decide that they are needed for the mutual defence of the Empire. So, any armed forces Greenmead builds up will be your armed forces not mine. Notwithstanding that, assuming I can find the funds to do so, I will take your advice and recruit a new regiment of line infantry. I also think that some light cavalry might be in order. They are quite the thing now, and seem to be of more use than heavy cavalry. The Empress Eloise smiled grimly. The Pink Hussars may have beaten the Karasenbachers at the Battle of the Heron Inn, she said, but I do not expect that to happen next time they meet, and, unless they are led by Captain Herker, light cavalry do not seem to have much success against infantry, but some light cavalry would be of use to me, so I approve of your suggestion. Meanwhile, Sir Stephen Green and what was left of the army he had commanded, had arrived back in Harrietton, where his wife suggested to him that his expedition had been a complete disaster. Sir Stephen begged to differ. From his perspective, it had been pleasant to see his native land again after an absence of several years, and he had had an excellent breakfast. When his wife suggested that it would have been nice if he could have stayed a bit longer, possibly in the capacity of Lord of Greenmead. He shrugged and suggested that you can have too much of a good thing, and he was sure that his niece would do an admirable job in that role. At this point, his wife swept out of the interview and went to find her sister. She found the Countess Harriet von Harrietten in conversation with Colonel Spankowitz who was elaborating on the glorious victory won for her by his pink hussars. The Countess von Harrietten cut him short and pointed out that if she won any more such victories, she would have no army left at all. As it was, Schnifflstadt now had control of Greenmead and the Countess, she stressed the word Countess, the Countess von Schnifflstadt was no doubt intent on acquiring further territory. At this point, Annabel von Harrietten suggested to her sister that attack was the best form of defence, and that she should immediately launch another assault on Greenmead, with the objective of installing Sir Stephen Green as its lord. The Countess Harriet von Harrietten shook her head. No, sister, she said. However much you wish to be Lady of Greenmead, that will not do. What is left of my army is not up to the task. 
I need time to recruit more soldiers to replace those that have fallen. And, while your husband's claim to be Lord of Greenmead may be useful to us in future, having seen what happens when he leads an army, I have no wish to see him attempt to govern a country. She turned to Colonel Spankovitz. Your man Herker seems to be very valiant. I will award him the Harrietenberg Cross first class. I will also promote him to be the Colonel of the Pink Hussars. For a second, the Colonel's composure was rattled, but then he reassumed his customary air of detachment and asked what he should do if he was no longer to be the Colonel of that gallant regiment. The Countess Harriet von Harrietten looked closely at him. I may come to regret this, she said, but it seems to me that your talents are more fitted to grand strategy than tactical manoeuvres on the battlefield. I promote you to Grand Marshal of Harrietten, commander of our glorious armies. Grand Marshal Baron Spankovitz nodded. In that capacity, he said, may I make two suggestions? Firstly, I think we should recruit not only to replace the men we have lost, but to further expand the army. I suggest creating another regiment of line infantry. And secondly, while I agree that marching back into Greenmead at present would not be altogether wise, there is merit in your sister's suggestion that attack is the best form of defence. Maybe, for example, we could cause some agitation in Kleinplatz. The story now turns from the lands to the east of Schnifflstadt to those to its west. After passing through Schnifflstadt, the winding river Schniffel slowly flowed on to the small town of Spongler. Below Spongler, the river was navigable, and barges passed up and down stream between Spongler and the port of Negroni, at the mouth of the river. Negroni was a busy port and an independent city-state, ruled by a senate composed of the heads of the richest and longest standing merchant houses of the city. Each year, the senate elected from its number a chief magistrate, the magister, and delegated to him responsibility for the day-to-day -day maintenance of law and order and administration. A magister could not serve consecutive terms, and could not make decisions or take actions that went beyond existing legislation. The geography of the region was such that goods landed at Negroni travelling inland had to pass through Spongler, which belonged to Schnifflstadt. The merchants of Negroni had become rich by importing goods from the lands over the sea and selling them to customers inland, and importing goods from inland and selling them to customers in the lands over the sea. They were well aware that should Schnifflstadt choose to close Spongler to their trade, their profits would dry up. Thus, when the Empress Eloise von Schnifflstadt suggested to the Magister of Negroni that, unless Negroni joined her empire, she would have to raise the tariffs charged at Spongler on goods going to and coming from Negroni, this caused considerable concern. The Senate convened to discuss the matter. A view was expressed that the Empress was bluffing. After all, if she raised tariffs too far, she would dry up the trade coming through Negroni, and then, as it was expressed, where would she get her tea and snuff? For a moment spirits rose, until it was pointed out that she could get them from Panini. Up the coast from Negroni, on the other side of the Purple Mountains, was the port of Panini. Panini was also an independent city-state, but, unlike Negroni, it was a monarchy, ruled by King Leonardo. The King of Panini was always called Leonardo, and the King at that time was the thirteenth of that name. Panini was also unlike Negroni, in that it was not rich. Although it had an excellent natural harbour, 
The only way to transport goods inland was by road, between the Purple Mountains and the Pananine Forest. Compared to transport by barge up the River Schnifel, this was slow, inefficient and expensive. Thus, Negroni flourished, while Panini stagnated. But the road from Panini led to Panneberg, and Panneberg belonged to Schnifelstadt, and the Senate of Negroni realised that if Schnifelstadt raised tariffs at Spongler and lowered them at Panneberg, all the trade that Negroni now enjoyed would instead go to Panini. What does joining this woman's empire entail? Someone asked. Apparently, it entailed that Negroni should place its armed forces at the disposal of Schnifelstadt whenever the Empress Eloise of the petty states decided that they were required for the mutual defence of her empire, and that Negroni should make an annual and sizeable contribution to the treasury of Schnifelstadt in order to pay for the protection that the combined armies of the empire would now provide to Negroni. The Senate observed that the only military threat to Negroni was currently from the armies of the empire. However, that threat was significant. While Negroni's armed forces all wore rather fetching purple coats, there was little else to be said for them. There was a single regiment of line infantry, the Negroni Grenadiers, under the command of Colonel Accardi. There was a single company of light infantry, raised in the Purple Mountains and commanded by Captain Ponzi, and therefore known as Ponzi's Purple Mountain Bersaglieri. And that was it. The Senate noted that this force had little chance of beating the army of Schnifelstadt, even given the recent casualties that army had suffered at the Battle of the Heron Inn, and concluded that, given the economic and military pressure Schnifelstadt could bring to bear on Negroni, it seemed that there was little option but to accept the suggestion that had been put to them by the Empress Eloise. But, as astute businessmen, the members of the Senate wondered if there was anything they could obtain from Schnifelstadt in return, and so they instructed the Magister to revert to the Empress Eloise, accepting her proposal, conditional on receiving undertakings from her, that Panini would not be accepted into the Empire under any circumstances, and that Schnifelstadt would raise the tariffs it applied to trade between Schnifelstadt and Panini. These terms were accepted by the Empress Eloise, and Negroni joined the Empire of the Petty States. Offshore from Panini lay the Isle of Cedars. The Isle of Cedars was the only place in the world where cedar squirrels lived. Cedar squirrels are rather inconsequential animals, but their fur is very good for making winter hats. Cedar squirrel hats were very popular in the earldom of Drek, which was situated immediately to the south of the Drekensback Mountains. These mountains were a cold and inhospitable environment, and a warm hat was essential. The one bright spot for the struggling economy of Panini was the export of cedar squirrel fur to Drek. The route by which cedar squirrel fur travelled from Panini to the earldom of Drek was firstly by road to Panneberg, at which point Schnifelstadt levied import duty. The road then ran through Schnifelstadt territory to the border town of Sheep, at which point Schnifelstadt levied export duty. From Sheep, the road ran to the town of Drek, the main town of the earldom. The Empress Eloise was true to her word and raised the tariffs Schnifelstadt applied to its trade with Panini. And she was not one to do things by half. Not only did she double the import duty charged at Panneberg, but she also doubled the export duty, charged specifically on cedar squirrel fur, at sheep. The outcome was that the price of cedar squirrel fur at Drek soared, and that the merchants of Panini and the hat wearers of Drek were both very unhappy. The Earl of Drek at that time was Ulrich, 
known as Ulrich the Angry, he was easily irritated and found the constant stream of complaints from his subjects regarding the price of cedar squirrel fur and the consequent risks of frost-bitten ears resulting from inadequate headgear to be extremely irritating. He sent an ultimatum to the Empress Eloise, stating that the increased rates of tax imposed on cedar squirrel fur by Schniffelstadt breached the age-old right of his subjects to have access to appropriate headwear at affordable prices, and that she should reduce the level of those taxes or face the consequences. He also started a correspondence with King Leonardo XIII of Panini regarding potential joint military action against Schniffelstadt. The Empress Eloise responded to Earl Ulrich by sending him a pair of knitting needles and suggesting that, if his subjects had cold ears, he knitted them some earmuffs, using the hair of the goats that were so plentiful in his domain. Earl Ulrich found this response unsatisfactory for various reasons. He could not knit, and, even if he could, every child knows that earmuffs made of goat hair are not an adequate substitute for a hat made of cedar squirrel fur. The result was that he got angry, and on the 1st of April, both the Earldom of Drek and the Kingdom of Panini declared war on the empire of the petty states. The armed forces of Drek consisted of two companies of light infantry, the first and second companies of the Drekensback Jaeger Corps. These were hardy mountain men, dressed in light grey uniforms with cedar squirrel hats. They had seen their families suffer that winter for want of adequate headwear and were determined to remedy that situation before winter returned. The main infantry force was the Earl's own regiment. Although the commanding officer of this regiment was nominally Earl Ulrich himself, in practice it was led by Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar. The regiment wore green coats and marched behind the green flags of the Earldom of Drek. The armed forces of Panini were gloriously attired in the turquoise colours of King Leonardo set off, in the case of the line infantry, by bright yellow trousers. These line infantry were the Royal Grenadiers, under the command of the Viscount Colonel Bellapasta. There was a company of light infantry, the King's Skirmishers, under the command of Captain Gelato. The cavalry consisted of the Royal Horse Regiment, comprising two squadrons of heavy cavalry, under the command of Colonel Melanzani. But Panini also had a secret weapon. Panini had a small navy. It consisted of exactly two warships, and one of these, the Cavatappi, had recently had its armament upgraded. As a result, several six-pounder cannon that had previously graced the Cavatappi's quarterdeck but were far too lightweight to do any meaningful damage to another warship, were now superfluous to the Navy's requirements. However, King Leonardo XIII reasoned that, while a ball from such a cannon might not inconvenience a ship, it would inflict grievous damage on a man, and was lightweight enough to be towed around by a small team of horses. He had therefore had six of these six-pounders mounted on carriages suitable for terrestrial rather than aquatic use, and so the first battery of the King's artillery had come into being. This artillery was King Leonardo's pride and joy, and he had placed it under the direct command of his eldest son, the Crown Prince Leonardo. The plan that Earl Ulrich and King Leonardo XIII had put together was simple. The Earl's army would march from Drek to Sheep and then continue south. The King's army would march from Panini to Panneberg and then continue east. The two armies would then unite and march on Schniffelstadt. 
Meanwhile, the Empress Eloise had been marshalling her forces. The Krasenbacher Regiment had spent the winter in barracks, drilling new recruits, and was now back at full strength. She ordered all four squadrons to march to Schniffelstadt and join up with the 1st Regiment of the Schniffelstadt Guards, which had likewise spent the winter repairing the losses it had incurred at the Battle of the Heron Inn. She also sent messengers to Greenmead, ordering the second regiment of the Schniffelstadt guards to immediately march to Schniffelstadt. This unit had spent the winter in Greenmead, helping to train the new military forces of Greenmead, and was therefore still under strength. Empress Eloise did not issue any orders to the armed forces of Greenmead, calculating that she should leave some sort of military presence facing Harrietten. However, she did send a message to Negroni, ordering that the entire army of Negroni immediately march to Schniffelstadt, where it was required for the mutual defence of the empire. The Krasenbacher regiment arrived at Schniffelstadt just as the Empress Eloise received news that King Leonardo XIII and his forces had reached Panneberg. There was still no news of the whereabouts of Earl Ulrich. The Empress calculated that she had an opportunity to defeat her enemies piecemeal, and without waiting for the fancy boys or the forces of Negroni, she marched the old boys and Krasenbackers out of Schniffelstadt to seek an early engagement with the army of Panini. The road from Schniffelstadt runs northeast for about 10 miles before it forks, with one branch heading north to Sheep and the other heading east to Panneberg. The countryside in this area is gently undulating meadowland. Surrounded by these meadows, just on the Schniffelstadt side of the road junction, can be found the buildings and fields of Tripod Farm. This is where the armies met. King Leonardo had deployed his light infantry behind a hedgerow in a field in front of the farm buildings. To the left, in a field on the other side of the road, he set up his cannon, again behind a hedge, but with a clear line of fire down the road to Schniffelstadt. Around the cannon were arrayed the Royal Grenadiers. Further to the left, the ground rose slightly to form a low ridge running parallel to the road, and on this higher ground were stationed the two squadrons of the Royal Horse Regiment. Along the road marched the first squadron of the Krasenbackers, followed by the second squadron and the Old Boys. The third squadron of Krasenbackers was on the left, and the fourth squadron on the right. When the first squadron of Krasenbackers was some 750 yards away, Crown Prince Leonardo ordered the six cannon of the first battery of the King's artillery to open fire directly down the road. The fire was completely unexpected and the effect was devastating. Cannonballs smashed into the first squadron of the Krasenbackers, bounded onward into the second squadron and further into the old boys. The road was bestrewn with mangled bits of horses and men. The Empress Eloise turned to Colonel von Flussing, who had replaced Colonel Blaumann as commanding officer of the old boys. What is happening to my army? she inquired. Colonel von Flussing was not a demonstrative man. He was the younger son of the Baron von Flussing, and so belonged to one of the most ancient, noble, and powerful families of Schniffelstadt. He had been taught from an early age to control his emotions, but on this occasion he failed to do so. The dirty cheating dogs, he raged. They are firing cannon at us. We are not at sea. The Schniffelstadt guards are not a ship. This is not acceptable. The Empress Eloise was patient with him. Whether or not you approve is irrelevant, she said. While shooting cannons at my army 
may be unacceptable to you, it is clearly very acceptable to King Leonardo, and he is the one we have to worry about. What do you think we should do? Meanwhile, the cannons fired again. Horses and men started to run back down the road, forcing their way through the ranks behind them. The scene was rapidly degenerating into chaos. The Empress Eloise made a decision. She turned to a staff officer by her side. Rally the troops, she said. Order the third and fourth squadrons of Krasenbackers forward to cover an orderly retreat. But it was too late. Even as the two squadrons of Krasenbackers moved forward on the flanks, the cannon roared again and, ignoring the commands of their empress, the centre of the Schniffelstadt army fled in disarray back the way it had come. As the fourth squadron of Krasenbackers advanced on the right, they were faced by the two squadrons of the Royal Horse Regiment, moving down the hill towards them. The commanding officer of the fourth squadron was Captain Schweif, a prudent man. Seeing that he was outnumbered two to one, he ordered his men to retreat. On the left, the third squadron was commanded by Captain Krupper. He was not a prudent man, and he believed that, whenever possible, cavalry should charge. Thus, seeing the king's skirmishers behind a hedge directly in front of him, charge is what he did. Charging a company of trained marksmen is a dangerous thing to do, especially if you present a large target, and the Karasenbackers were all big men, mounted on even bigger horses. The accurate fire of the king's skirmishers halted the charge before it reached the hedge. The cavalry wavered to and fro as the men tried to retreat and the officers tried to drive them forward. And all the time, the king's skirmishers picked off more and more men and horses. On the Panini left, Colonel Melanzani had seen the third squadron of Krasenbackers charge the king's skirmishers. He therefore ordered the Royal Horse Regiment to wheel right and ride to the aid of the light infantry, leaving the fourth squadron of Krasenbackers to retreat without molestation. Thus, as the third squadron of Krasenbackers wavered under the king's skirmishers' fire, the first squadron of the Royal Horse Regiment charged into their flank and scattered them to the four winds. Thus ended the Battle of Tripod Farm. The Empress Eloise and her shattered army limped back to Schniffelstadt, where there was a message awaiting her. There was trouble in Kleinplatz. <laughs>